welcome to Behind the Scenes. I am your host, Hector Montalvo. This show is dedicated to asking tough questions for you, the viewers. We bring you their responses, and we let you decide. Joining us here today at our MCTV studios, we're joined by Chairman of the Fatherhood Coalition, Mr. Joe Urenic, and also joined by, uh, with us in the studio, is researcher for the Fatherhood Coalition, Mr. Pat McCabe. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thanks, Thanks for having us, Hector. Gentlemen, this show has covered the issue of restraining orders, the abuse, the effects, and even how judges issue these orders. With the Commonwealth issuing anywhere between 25 and 50,000 restraining order each year, do those numbers tell us that we have a serious problem in the Commonwealth or are judges just handling, giving these out like handy? Well, we have a serious problem. That's most certainly in the Commonwealth, but it's not uh, as most people would think that there's a problem of um, abuse going on. There's a problem of uh, over-issuance of restraining orders that have a very uh, deleterious effect, very serious and negative effect on many people's lives. Uh, so yes, there is a serious problem. It's a uh, court system that is overusing restraining orders and abusing the use of restraining orders particularly against men and fathers in the state. Now, the restraining orders um, are designed basically to protect those people that may be in fear of immediate harm or are being uh, physically abused and so on. Now, we, we, should, we see that people are just going in and not just, and they're not proving a case for a restraining order, but yet we see them being issued. Well, well there is a clear uh, basis, which the court is very happy to mention time again. It's, it's like you said, there, there's an acronym for it. It's FISH, Fear of Imminent Serious Physical Harm. However, one of the other things that we do is uh, we are court watchers. When we're asked to, we will go into court to uh, watch a session when someone of interest is in there who has this issue. Uh, there's no question the judges are not following the law, and there's, there's no question that they know about it. Uh, just no, nothing's being done to get the judges to follow the law and stop uh, issuing these inappropriate restraining orders. There's other restraining orders where it's a he said, she said type of situation, and you could always argue what the judge's judgment was in that situation. Uh, but that, that's a different um, um, a kettle of fish. But certainly the judges are issuing restraining orders which they know are inappropriate. Now, I understand that there is a big push going on in the State House uh, to reform the 209 aides as they are now because of the abuse. I understand that there are also uh, uh, landlords would be affected if a restraining order is actually taken out on a particular victim and they can't even get evicted by, by just having a restraining order. They can just go to uh, the landlord and say, look, I have a restraining order. Landlord is not required to, um, to evict them under the proposed legislation. It's prevented that's from evicting. Correct. Yeah. I mean, is that going to be another effect on, on another part of individuals? I know right now restraining orders affect children. It affects parents, men, women. Um, now, it seems like landlords are going to be affected under this. Yes, there was, there was a, um, uh, a bill similar to this uh, a year or so ago. And... Um, the Small Homeowners Association, I believe out of Cambridge, Mass, mounted a vigorous campaign to defeat it, and it was defeated uh, last time around. So I would expect that most um, homeowners and small business uh, homeowners uh, would uh, again rally to defeat that, that bill. Uh, the Fatherhood Coalition is uh, lobbying uh, legislators this session to revise the current restraining order law. Uh, there are a number of bills out there, some of them um, um, sort of heading in the right direction and some of them pretty bad. Uh, there's one bill that was presented by um, Senator Bador of this area um, and he wanted to, he wants to have the photograph of uh, those recipients of restraining orders be placed on the order itself. I'm not sure the exact reason for that but it seems to me another one of those um, uh, steps that will not address the the main problem which is that the restraining order law is intrinsically flawed. It's rotten at its core. And uh, to put on another uh, layer on top of this is not the right way to go. Uh, there's other, uh, as you mentioned, the, the uh, landlord, uh, to prevent landlords from evicting a restraining order um, uh, person uh, is also uh, in the works. 
Uh, there's another law that would make the New England states join together in a multi-state restraint, restraining order uh, regime. Um, there are laws to include the pets of um, people who are restraining orders in a restraining order. Uh, all of these laws are really missing the main point, which is the restraining order law itself uh, is, is flawed. It should not be in place. If any, if any revisions are made to it, it should be to ensure the due process of those who are being subject to a restraining order and ensure that they are not being uh, denied their due process rights and um, uh, in the process and in that uh, lose perhaps their custody of their children if they have children or uh, be evicted from their home uh, when they have a, a family home, etc. There's so many problems with the existing restraining order that any move to sort of build on that is the wrong way to go. Uh, some legislators are doing it. We're talking with as many legislators as we can, and we hope this year that we'll at least start moving the restraining order law in the right direction um, and uh, make a change for the better. One, one of the things that surprises me about the current uh, restraining order and the direction some people are trying to push it is, is what is the demand uh, for certain aspects of the restraining order. For example, as you've mentioned before, restraining orders are a civil issue to get it, but if you violate it, it's a criminal issue. And that's a very unique law. And it's, I'm unaware that there was any justification for writing this very unique law. And of course, I, I still think it's up to the courts to decide how much of this law is actually legal. Uh, it's something that no other law does, so I think they really need to look at it. For example, the pictures, that's an added cost for the state to pick up. What is the purpose for putting the pictures on? I mean, if I had a restraining order, I wouldn't mind having my picture on because I think I'm a handsome fellow. But other than that, I don't know why you would want to do it. Now, I know that it recently came to our attention that the, um, the Jane Doe Foundation had a banner displayed outside of the State House. And it appeared that the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was trying to convey that men were the only domestic violence people out there. Well, Do you see that being the actual case? Well, certainly working with Jane Doe, Jane Doe has had a long history of trying to get that message out that men are the problem and therefore men are the solution. In conversations that I have had with the State House, they've made it very clear that if that was the message that was getting out, uh, it was not their intention to be part of that message. But there is a long history of Jane Doe um, be basically bashing men, uh, appearing to be a hate group when it comes to their attitude towards men. They, they do do uh, work with uh, some very good groups, uh, but you know anybody can help good groups. That You don't have to be a good person to help uh, good groups. Uh, but I think it's important for Jane Doe to kind of uh, not involve in, in this bashing of, of men. I don't think it helps anyone. It, I don't think it helps victims of uh, violence, uh, and it certainly doesn't help the men that they're bashing. Uh, so I think Jane Doe has a very long history of uh, bashing men, and that's the reason why their banner was looked at as something that was inappropriate, and uh, we're, we're trying to reach out to them to come to a common ground in the hopes that they will turn away from behavior that we uh, think doesn't help them at all. Now, Joe, you mentioned that uh, the Fatherhood Coalition has um, legislation that they brought forward to try to reform right. the 209. Can you tell us what are you looking to reform in the 209A? What would you like to see happen Yes, I, I think that um, uh, when I meet with the legislators, I uh, tell them that we think the law should be scrapped altogether. But barring that, we think there are some um, revisions in the law that would go a long way to making it less onerous. And one of the revisions, I, I would point out three of them. The first one I would point out is that in the definition of abuse, there is a clause that says some, putting someone in fear of imminent serious physical harm, as Pat mentioned, is a... Um, uh, would qualify as a as uh, needing a, a restraining order, so we would change that and take out the word fear and actually put in the word threaten someone with immediate serious physical harm. So this whole um, uh, psychiatric approach to um, looking at people's lives and determining whether they are subject to some kind of domestic violence or abuse by putting in the word fear there, I think, is is completely wrong, and we would take that out. Uh, another um, aspect that we would change is to make any violation of a law dependent on intent. In other words, right now, if someone unintentionally crosses path with the person who took out a restraining order, that is a criminal violation, and they can be put into jail for up to two and a half years. 
Now, uh, that strikes us as completely uh, wrong-headed, completely unjust, and it should be changed. Um, as a matter of fact, there's, there are, going back to the legislation for a minute, there are legislators now who are submitting bills on uh, this session who would, that would increase the incarceration period up to a period of 10 years if someone is, uh, re repeats a violation. Now, if the violation is being caused by the person who took out the, the restraining order in the beginning, to put someone under the threat of 10 years incarceration is completely unjust. It's unjust now. It's, it's completely monstrous to have them thrown in jail for t up to 10 years. Uh, and the third thing that I would say that we're looking at in terms of the re revising the existing law is that once an ex parte order is granted, which means ex parte means one person goes before the judge and they, they, they says, I need a restraining order, the judge will grant it for a temporary basis of up to 10 days. Once that uh, ex parte order is issued, the very issuance of that will put it into the what's called the domestic violence database. And uh, being put in that database can have uh, very negative effects for, for people in terms of their employment um, and what they can, perhaps custody of children in the future. Uh, and so that by itself is a very negative thing. So we are saying uh, in some of the legislation that we propose is that no order be uh, put into any database until it's made uh, for a one-year period. And that after a one-year period, if the order is not continued, then it should be taken out of the database and that there be no permanent orders issued, which there are now. People will get a permanent order and will stay there forever. Uh, until they um, are no longer with us. So I would say those three um, changes would go a long way to, to making the, um, the current law less onerous. But I think the very basis of the law, as we noted a few minutes ago, uh, is a very sexist one. It really, the underlying theme is that, again back to the Jane Doe banner, the very theme is that men are uh, inherently batterers and violent towards women, and so we need a special law to protect the victims, the women, from the batter is the men. And I think that underlying theme is really what's causing a lot of the problems that we have. And that's one thing that uh, research has for the most part shown is that domestic violence is not a gender issue. So for the organizations that have exploited domestic violence by claiming it's a gender issue, uh, they're, they're not serving people and they're not being honest about uh, uh, the issue. And this concerns me when it comes to violations of restraining orders. There's no evidence anywhere to su suggest that there's a problem with the type of uh, punishments people are getting for a violation of a restraining order. So why would somebody be asking that uh, a sentence go from two and a half years to ten years? I mean, if you, if, if you, if you, if you kill someone, you're going to get out before someone uh, did who had a restraining order on them. And, and this is the mentality of, of some groups that are trying to push these restraining orders. They're not trying to help people. They're angry people, and they, they want men to be treated worse than they already are. And I think it's a shame. Well, no. In fact, we had one of our members uh, who was recently uh, put into um, the jail for 14 months. He was sentenced to 18 months, and he says that many people came in for other charges that came and they left. They came and they, they left while he was still in jail. And his um, uh, his violation of restraining order was a, a really a, something that any reasonable person would never consider a crime. Uh, he had he had returned a set of keys to his former spouse through a third party, and he was put into jail for 14 months because of that. I mean, it, it's it really um, seems like the the whole justice system and, and society broadly is perhaps. Uh, is upside down at this point where people are being criminalized for things that should never be considered criminal. Yeah, especially, um, you know, if the order is taken out, you're ordered now to surrender your, your, your gun. If you're a gun owner, uh, you're ordered to refrain from being at a particular location, maybe even your own home. Sure, sure. Uh, and there's even a, a spot in those restraining orders that will even order you uh, from having contact with your children. Right. And, and, and we're, we're, we're trying to change that. As a matter of fact, we have talked to uh, uh, certain members of the judiciary. They have issues uh, with the restraining order as well. And, and one of the things is when it comes to children, uh, although any judge might want to make a decision if there is an emergency for a short-term thing, but when it comes to children, uh, the proper place for those decisions is the family court. 
uh, because if, if at all, I mean, if, if at all, all. If at all. Uh, district courts it really isn't their um, their uh, their strong point to to make decisions about uh, children, and uh, the, the fact that any judge can make that decision without actually hearing the facts appropriately, without having the experience, without having the support to do it, it is really a shame. But a lot of district court judges uh, will take children away from parents, and it's very questionable that those parents did anything wrong because it's a civil matter. It's not a criminal matter. These people are not being uh, criminally charged of anything. They're not being prosecuted or found guilty of doing anything wrong, but they're losing their children. Now, it's been stated on this particular show we've had uh, on the restraining order issue where an attorney had to come on the show and indicated to us that 209As could be considered unconstitutional, just in, in, in the way it is right now. Um, we understand that when people go in to file a restraining order, there is an affidavit that they have to fill out. Everything that they're stating there is true to the best of their knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, if not, it could be considered a perjury. Now, we understand mm -hmm. that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts don't prosecute perjury for restraining orders. I don't okay. think per, 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 perjury is, is, is very often prosecuted at all, uh, not just for restraining orders. It's just not an issue that, that our government tends to want to get into. But, you know, a judge has a responsibility to listen to the evidence that's being presented. He's supposed to make a judgment as, as to whether the uh, people are credible or not. Well, when you, when you have uh, situations as, as we have witnessed where a judge isn't even um, making sure that the, what, what the person states is up to the letter of the law, you have a problem with the judge already. And then, you know, you have to wonder if they're actually looking at the accuser uh, uh, appropriately. Are, are they really balancing what they're saying against whatever the facts are. Uh, if they're already prone to giving out restraining orders when they're not supposed to be given out, I, I would think that it's likely that even when someone makes a statement that may not be true, that they're going to be prone to go to that side, and I think that's unfortunate. And I just want to remind the viewers, you are watching Behind the Scenes. I am your host, Hector Montalvo. We are joined in studio today with the chairman of the Fatherhood Coalition, Mr. Joe Urenic and researcher for the Fatherhood Coalition, Pat McCabe. If you have a question that you want us to ask government or your legal representation, send us an email at the Hector Montalvo Show at yahoo.com. You can also visit our website at behindthescenes.weebly.com. Or visit us on Facebook, Behind the Scenes with Hector Montalvo. Joe, we know that there is good legislation to reform the actual restraining orders. What are some of the other legislations that are out there right now opposing the reform for the 209A, if you know of any? Well, I mentioned a few already. There's, uh, there's legislation that would um, make the penalties for violations even greater. There's legislation, as you mentioned, that would uh, include the uh, landlord in the in the process. Um, there's legislation that would make it a multi-state issue and thereby build a, a bigger regime of the restraining order. Uh, and there's the photographs for the restraining for that as well. There's a number of bills. Uh, there's about 35 bills altogether that I've seen on the legislature's website about 209As. I would say most of them are pretty bad. Uh, and a few of them are going in the right direction. There was one um, submitted by Senator Tarr uh, that would give the police a little bit of more, a little more leeway in terms of making an arrest if they went to respond to a restraining order call and not just assume that the man was the um, person who should be arrested. Um, we're hoping that he might, Senator Tarr might consider um, revising that as well. Um, well there, that leaves the door open for just even an accusation if the police were involved in that because restraining orders are, or alleged accusations, mm -hmm. they're not something that is 
been proven, right, correct? Right, right. So doesn't that leave the door open? Uh, because as it stands right now, an accusation is considered an arrestable offense. Right. I think the that would, the, the proposal by Senator Ty, I believe, would take that away, that it would not be arrestable if in, if in the judgment of the police there was no cause to arrest. So I think that's a big deal if it were to actually go through. It's, it's something in the right direction. Uh, Senator uh, Ta has uh, another bill out. I'm trying to think of exactly the, the, um, the specifics, but it, was, it wasn't in the same. It was sort of, um, it was almost as if he had a bit of uh, schizophrenia. He had a fairly uh, positive one in, in the one we just discussed, and he had another bill that was not so positive. Um, so I think, um, I think that all of the legislators, perhaps there's one or two out there, they have, there's, there's little recognition of how seriously flawed the underlying law is and that it really shouldn't be on the books at all. And I think that when we go to the State House and talk with them, we make the, the point first and foremost that the law itself is intrinsically flawed. It's rotten at its core. It should be um, uh, revoked. Um, barring that, here are some things that you can do to um, make it less, uh, less onerous on, on people. Well, I, I think one of the reasons, uh, I, I, when I speak to legislatures, they seem to be aware of the nature of the 209A law and the problems. But one of the things that you have to realize is there's a lot of federal money uh, coming to the states in order to support these laws. And, and, and uh, it's just the nature of the business. If there's money, you want to keep it flowing. So one of the things that we're trying to do is speak more uh, with our elected officials to understand what they need to do to keep this money flowing our way. Is Are there other ways of using uh, the money from the federal government as opposed to just beating up on a bunch of men? Is there a way to actually help the community uh, either address issues or heal? Uh, right now, I think uh, using the money for the restraining orders, it's not really being helpful. There's 50,000 of them that go out. Um, there's no reason to believe there's any justification for that number, but you have to find some something to do with the money. So I would just suggest still take the money, but figure out if there's other things you can do with it. Well, I might add, there is some uh, a movement afoot. Speaking of the, the money, the federal money that comes down, there is a movement in Washington by some groups and some Congress people are arguing that the, uh, the VAWA, which is the main source of funds for this, for the 209A programs, uh, should be cut because there's a lot of uh, cutting going on in Washington, and that is on the chopping block. Uh, I think it would be a wonderful thing if they cut off the VAWA funds. I mean, there, it really is something that should not be there. They should not be funding these programs. So. Now, restraining orders could be anyone can go out and obtain a restraining order, either in district court, juvenile court, family court, mm -hmm. and uh, Boston Municipal Courts. And mostly so on. women get them, regardless of who tries to get them. So they mostly women do get these actual restraining right. orders versus men. Right. Now, should if if a restraining order is a civil order and they hold criminal implications, why not take away the power from the other courts and keep it into the judiciary system where they tend to go with your due process, the right to have a jury. You're talking uh, about trial court. Correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not take away the restraining order from, let's say, probate court and bring them over to the judiciary trial court? Dad and I were speaking about this on the, on the way up. Um, uh, in fact, most of the restraining orders are granted in district court. Um, and most of them um, may or may not have um, children involved, but as Pat mentioned, if it's in district court, there's no, there's no reason and no power that a district court judge has to actually take a children away from their um, father or their parent. We see that um, happen. We see that happen every It happens every all the Monday. time, right, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't be happening. And, and, and one, of the, one of the suggestions is to have that, that checkup box, that's all it is on the restraining order form, have that taken off at least for the district court or, or get it over to the family court. So one of the reasons we think it should be in family court because if children are involved, that aspect of at least, I believe, should be in family court because they're the only ones that are, are really in the business of dealing with families. But uh, I, I don't know that the rights of uh, the defendants in the restraining order are, are particularly well protected at all. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, as I said, it's a very strange law in that it's, uh, to get it, it's civil, 
you violate it, it becomes criminal. Uh, if, for example, you were dealing with uh, child support, uh, that, that's a civil matter. And in order for that violation to get criminal, there's a whole process that you go through. So there's an opportunity to have your voice heard or to have your rights respected. In the restraining order, it starts off civil, it immediately goes criminal. And as we've heard, some people want it to go criminal uh, with even higher punishments. It's, it's a very bizarre law. There, there's nothing that I'm aware of that's, that's like it. And I do think it's inappropriate. Uh, and you're just trying to throw a lot of people in jail for no good reason. Now, do you know what the protocol is? Because I understand that even though it's, it's civil, these orders are usually served either by court officers in hand in the court or police departments in general. Uh, is there a process that um, they must meet in order for someone to know that there is a restraining order in effect against you? Well, it's, it's just the service aspect, and that's just like an, any, uh, any order, any motion that has to be served, they use that process for serving you. Um, unfortunately, I believe uh, from what I have read, the courts are trying to relax the service on restraining orders. For example, if they deliver it to your last known address, which you don't actually live live at, I believe they consider that as service, which is is is, is unfortunate. Um, I, I've had situations where people are aware there's a restraining order, and they try to go get it to find out what it is, and they find out that police officers are not always um, helpful in providing you with information. So, uh, what the court has done, there are situations where. There can be a restraining order against you. You have had not had the opportunity to see what it is, so you don't know what you're supposed to do, and suddenly, criminal violation. Um, again, I don't think there's any other law out there like the restraining order, and I really hope it would be um, changed in some manner. So if you're a parent and uh, your child has a hockey game going on or something to that effect, and you decide to go there and you did not know that there was a restraining order, chances are you could end up yes, getting well, arrested. Yes, well, we are aware of somebody recently, one of our members who ended up going to jail for, for 10 days for that particular reason. So, um, you know, I think it's important that your viewers realize that even though many people, perhaps most people, have not yet fallen prey to this this really insidious um, law that it really could happen to anyone uh, could, because it really is um, if two people have a harmonious relationship and then an, and one time they have a breakdown of some sort at that moment of a breakdown which in a normal society would be dealt with between the parties in this particular time that we're living in one party can make it bring it into the court and the whole family structure can be thrown uh, into the abyss. I mean, they're falling, breaking down completely. So for those people who are watching who think it doesn't affect them, it can easily affect them at, the, at a moment's notice, and they should really look uh, very closely at this law. So we know that the restraining orders benefit people that are actually being physically violent, uh, being abusive, or someone that's being abused by someone abusive. Uh, it affects them. Uh, is, how does it affect the system? I mean, you know, we mentioned the, the revenues coming in from the federal government. So is this a revenue type of thing to keep more money coming in versus protecting due process, civil rights, the children? Well, per, people do certainly make money off it. If you're, in, if you're in probate court and there's a custody battle going on, it's one part of the arsenal that keeps the battle going. And the lawyers who are involved in the custody battle are making money um, because the, the uh, battle is, is, is ongoing and, and prolonged. So stay well, out of court is the message. Stay basically. out of court is the best message but, for everyone. But it also uses a lot of resources. It lot, uses a lot of police resources. I live in a neighborhood where um, there isn't a lot going on. It's a very low crime neighborhood. So what the what what our police are constantly telling our community associations, they spend most of their time dealing with domestic issues which is, well, they're doing something, but uh, on occasion, something does happen. We actually had someone fire a gun in our neighborhood uh, probably about a year and a half ago, which is really inappropriate for our neighborhood, and uh, the response that the police were giving was not making the neighborhood happy. But at the same time, they're telling us about all this response to domestic violence. Well, I think filing, filing, uh, firing a gun is a bit more uh, important than two people having an argument. Great, and we can continue on for days on this particular subject and also the child abuse. Uh, really quick, fatherhoodcoalition.org is uh, the website. The website, to, to uh, fatherhoodcoalition.org, and we have a hotline 
617 sad dads to call well we thank you for all the work that you are doing out there to bring this issue to light we want to thank you for coming in today and we want to thank the thank crew you. at mctv the staff at mctv and i want to thank you at home for watching join us next time as we go behind the scenes to ask the tough questions bring you their responses and we let you decide thank you for watching